This is the day, Lord, that you have made. Help us to, be rejo- to rejoice and to be glad in it, because there will be no other day like it. You are here, God. And you are waiting for us to, to speak to you. You're waiting for us to, to just sit in your presence and to listen to what it is you have to say to us this morning. And in your presence, it's your peace that passes all understanding that you give to us. So may we truly hear you this morning. And may we experience your peace. We've come, God, into your holy presence. And we've come in faith this morning. We've come knowing that you know absolutely everything about this world and about our lives. You know what the next moment's going to bring. You know what tomorrow will bring. We've come. We've come to talk to you. We've come to sing praises to you. We've come to read your precious and powerful word. And so in this hour of worship, we humbly request that you would speak to us. We come humble and, and thankful because we are very conscious of the fact, God, that you are the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer of this world and our lives. You're the one that holds us in your hands. You're the one that we praise. You're the one that cares about us. You're all powerful and all knowing and all present. And it's into your presence that we've come. We've come expectant. We've come with joys and we've come with sorrows. We've come. We give you thanks for the week that has passed. We know that there have been moments of trouble and moments of hardship and pain and suffering for some people. But God, our confidence is that you will work in all circumstances and you will work for our good because that is your promise in your word. So God, would you work in the face of the challenges that we do encounter? We acknowledge that the week the week that has passed, but we also know that there's a new week waiting for us. When we leave from the sanctuary this morning, we start a new beginning. And so we pray for the week that lies ahead. It's your word that sustains us. It's your word that nourishes us and fills us. It's your word that we've come to listen to. It's your peace that we've come to experience. We've come to be blessed by you this morning so that when we leave from the sanctuary this morning, we can be a blessing to others. So come Holy Spirit. Fill our lives, fill our voices, fill our worship. Come Holy Spirit and open our ears that we would truly hear. Come, Holy Spirit, and open our eyes that we would see with your eyes. Come, Holy Spirit, and open our hearts that we would receive that which you have for us this day. Great is your faithfulness, God. Morning by morning, new mercies we receive. And you have something for us this day to receive. When the disciples were terrified by the storm at sea, you were with them and you brought only but peace and serenity and calmness to their lives. And you brought them, the scripture says, to a safe place. To a safe place. And this is a safe place that we've gathered in. And so calm us that we would know your presence that we would know your peace and that you would bring us to the safety of your heart. There is only one God and he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think or ever imagine according to his power that works within us. So work within us 
and do exceedingly abundantly in and through our lives more than we could ever dream or imagine. In your name, Jesus, we humbly pray this morning. Amen. I'm going to invite those that are reading to come forward and do so. And kids, you can go off to, to Sunday school. The first reading this morning is from 2 Kings chapter 4 right at the end of it, verse 42. Let us pray. Lord, bless these readings to our ears and minds so that we hear and understand all that you want us to. Help us put the lessons we learn into our lives so that we can share our knowledge of you and your love of us to others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Kings chapter 4 Verse 42. A man came from Baal Shalashah, bringing the man of God twenty loaves of barley bread baked from the first ripe corn, along with some ears of new corn. Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said. How can I set this before a hundred men? his servant asked. But Elisha answered, Give it to the people to eat, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat and have some left over. Then he set it before them, and they ate, and had some left over, according to the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. A prayer for the Ephesians. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God not to him who is able to do immeasurably immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The Gospel this morning is John chapter 6. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 21. I'm also going to work from this text this morning. Well-known stories. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on the hillside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered, eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each person to have one bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who had seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they'd all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of fish and the five barley loaves left over. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who used to come into the world. 
Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and, and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. But night was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed five or six kilometers, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. And they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. May God add his blessing to his word this morning. All of the readings laid out in the lectionary for this morning, the Old Testament, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus and the Gospel reading are all texts that I think any preacher would want to, to just um, deal with and expound to a congregation. But I I've, I've felt particularly led to work with the Gospel reading this morning. There's, as you would obviously know, there's lots one could say about that reading. But I'm just going to share a few thoughts that I pray will sustain you and strengthen you and give you some food for thought in the week ahead. So we read of the story of of the feeding of the 5,000 and the very next verse after John tells us that story, it's the story of Jesus walking on on the water. Two miracle stories. But I think there's more than these stories being just about a miracle. I think John, the writer, the author, wants us to see the presence of Jesus. He wants us to see the presence of Jesus. In the feeding of the of the five thousand, Jesus was teaching his audience, the crowd that day, something that would help them, something that would be of help to them, something that would help them cope in the midst of the storms of life. And these these two stories, I firmly believe, are placed together by John for a reason. John wants you to believe in Jesus. That's the purpose of the Gospel of John. Everything is directed to the reader to believe in Jesus. To believe that if your soul is hungry or you are being battered by the storms of life. To believe that Jesus is present and only He can satisfy the hunger and only He, through His presence, can calm the storm. And I think that is the crux of what John is wanting us to see. So in the feeling of the 5,000, we meet Philip. Jesus says to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? And Philip looks and assesses the situation logically. And he sees it's pretty hopeless. And in his mind he says, but there's nothing that can be done here. There's nothing that can be done here. He looks at the problem. There's 5,000 men. Now, most, a lot of them would have had wives. They would have had children. So historians tell us there probably could have been fifteen to 20,000 people Philip's probably like any one of us. We would have looked at the situation, assessed it and said, but our resources cannot feed and meet the needs of these people. This is hopeless. What are we going to do? Philip, in fact, says to Jesus in the gospel, eight months' wages would not be enough to buy bread for each person here to even have one bite. And Philip, in that very moment, forgets that the man standing next to him, Jesus, he has a father. And his father is God, who for Israel, when they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, needed millions and millions and millions, you can, do, you can do the maths if you've got time, millions, tons of food a day to feed the Israelites. Millions of tons a day for 40 years to feed the millions of Israelites. He forgets the man standing next to him has a father who did that. So Philip looks at the problem, sees it insurmountable in his eyes, and leaves Jesus out of the picture. The same thing happened on the Sea of Galilee. Sea is raging, the disciples panic and fear for their lives. And yet, just a few hours earlier, they have witnessed Jesus feeding the multitudes, solving an enormous problem. Twelve baskets of food, John tells us, are left over. And how many disciples are on the boat? And I think with the 12 baskets of food that were left over, because they would have carried, history tells us that they carried food with them. So 12 baskets of food, 12 disciples on the boat, probably with these 12 baskets of food, just kind of wedged between their legs to hold it tight. So each disciple, picture this in your mind. 
Each disciple is sitting there on this boat, sea raging around them, with a reminder of the power of God. Right there. With the basket in their hands. With a basket of, of miracle food. And in the midst of the storm, what do they say? God, please help us. We can't cope. We don't know what's going on. We're afraid. We're terrified. We may die. And they're holding a basket. We do the same. We sweat. We agonize about situations we can't handle in our own strength. And we forget that there's Jesus. And we forget what Jesus is capable of doing. We forget even what Paul said to the church in Ephesus, that he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could ever ask or imagine. I think Jesus wanted the disciples to learn that they mustn't face a problem in their own strength. They mustn't face their problems with their own resources. But they must include him because when he's included, he changes circumstances. And maybe Philip should have said to Jesus, instead of saying to Jesus, what on earth are we going to do? How are we going to feed all these hungry mouths? Maybe he should have said, Lord, this problem is far too big for us. But for you it's not. Paul understood that. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, immeasurably more than you and I could ever dream or imagine. And then there's Andrew. And Andrew has a slightly different attitude. He's the man who said, well, I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. And then I'll trust you, Jesus, to do the rest. And with that, he goes and finds a little boy. Just a little boy. And the little boy's got five small barley loaves and and two small fish. And with that, he gives it to Jesus. What does Jesus do? He gives thanks to his father and he distributes the food. And you know the rest of the story. And then Jesus goes up the mountainside to rest and so John takes us into the next part of the story Jesus walking on the water and again I don't think that Jesus is walking on the water describes or the point of the story is that we may see this extraordinary miracle but I think what we need to see is just a simple incident <coughs> that we see Jesus in a way that maybe we've never seen him before and we will never forget what he's like He says to these disciples who are fearing for their lives, it is I, don't be afraid. And so, so often people follow Jesus because of the signs and because of the miracles and because of the wonders they have seen. And in the story of the 5,000, there's a high probability that that is exactly what was happening. These crowds had gathered to listen to Jesus because they'd seen the miracles he'd performed. In fact, it tells us before that, they'd watched him. So of course they're going to follow him. And they followed Jesus because they've seen these miracles and now they're following him for the wrong reasons. Sometimes we behave like the crowd. We follow Jesus because we think he can instantly solve our problem. And we have to admit that there are times in our lives when all we want Jesus for is healing from a disease or instant financial provision or a miracle to solve a difficult situation. And sometimes, thank God, we get those miracles and we get those answers. But so often, I think all we need, all some people need, is just the simple reassurance that Jesus is present. That Jesus is present. Sometimes we look for all these big fancy things out there. I really believe that that's the crux of the matter of these stories this morning. So we see these miraculous signs and wonders, but the crux of the matter is John, the writer, wants us to see that Jesus is present. He's present. It is I, he says, don't be afraid. That that presence of Jesus that can feed the hungry soul, that presence of Jesus that can heal a, a broken heart, that presence of Jesus that can get the boat safely to the shore, that can calm the greatest fear. It's the presence of Jesus, nothing else. Sometimes all we need, as Paul said in Ephesians, the text that um, Sue read to us, all we need is to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ so that we may be full to the measure of the fullness of God. Sometimes I think that's all we need. Just to grasp something of the breadth and depth and length of the love of God. And that, I think, solves a multitude of problems. 
So in both stories, I want to take us away from the focus, focusing just on these miracles that so often we interpret as the key. But to see how Jesus acted, to see how Jesus really teaches us who he is, so we can trust him in those times. So yes, he responds to the people's needs, like he responds to our needs, hunger, thirst, pain, suffering, whatever they are. He, he responds through these miracles. He responds. But he really responds through being present. Through being present. Jesus always is watching over us. After the feeding of the 5,000, the disciples go down to the lake. Jesus goes up to the mountain to rest and get away from the crowd. The disciples settle for Capernaum. They're moving on, crossing the sea. But up on the mountain, Jesus is watching them. He's not forgotten about his disciples. And in the moment of this, this crisis and fear for their lives, John the writer suddenly realizes that even while they're pulling their oars and struggling against the, 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 the waves and the wind that's battering them, suddenly remembers that Jesus is looking at them in this loving way, watching over them. I think there's the less, another lesson for us. He doesn't make things easy for us. He never said life was going to be easy. He lets us fight our own battles and make our own decisions. But we live life under this loving eye of Jesus always watching over us. That's how we live our lives. Under the loving eye of Jesus watching over us. So while you're pulling at your oars and paddling in your boat, making your decisions, fighting your battles, the loving eye of, of Jesus is watching you. And then Jesus comes comes down from the hillside to help his, his disciples in a crisis. Because Jesus doesn't watch us from a distance. He doesn't remain detached from us. When he sees our strength is failing, he comes. He comes. He always comes to us. Always in the storms of life as well. The words of God to Isaiah, chapter 43 and verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. They will not. They will not. Because Jesus comes, not when we think he must come, but he comes in his own time. In the story, Jesus seemed to wait until the boat was five or six kilometers away, as far from the land as possible. When all their hope is gone, when they are totally exhausted, that's when Jesus came. And why does Jesus walk on the water? To show his disciples that the very thing that they feared, the very thing that they feared, this raging sea, was merely as, as, as a set of steps for him to come to them. That's all it was for him. Just a set of steps for him to come to them. And often we fear the, the difficult and challenging experiences of life, such as illness or loss of a loved one or financial hardships. And often with hindsight or sometimes in those situations to discover that, that they bring us closer to Jesus. Like he walked on the difficulties of the water. So he walks over those difficult situations to come to us. So he watches us. We're under the loving eye of Jesus. He comes to us. Why does he come to us? He comes to us to help us. Let's go back to the feeding of the 5,000 just briefly. This little boy. He hasn't got much to bring. He's got barley bread. Barley bread was the food of the poor. It was the cheapest of all bread. It's not like a nice loaf of bread like we know, no, no bread. Just cheap, just like little biscuits, little flat biscuits almost. Not tasty at all. And the fish that he brought to Jesus wasn't fresh hake or tuna or dorado or anything that we would think is delicious. They were little fish no bigger than smelly sardines. Bony, little Probably not even tasty fish. That's what he bought. That was his packed. That was his packed lunch. And in those days, they had no refrigeration, so his mother couldn't have kept this fresh, this fish fresh for a while. So they pickled their fish. So he had the smelly little bit of pickled fish and these tiny little biscuits of barley to eat his fish with. That's what he had. There's nothing fancy about that. But he takes this little insignificant amount of food and puts it into the hands of God. 
puts it into the hands of God. With the loving eyes of Jesus looking over this meal. And you know the rest of the story. Jesus always helps us. He always comes to help us. All we have to do is do what the little boy did. Just come in faith and put this little bit of brokenness or whatever it is we've got into the hands of God. Jesus watches. Jesus comes. Jesus helps. And that's the joy of being a Christian. It's of having Christ in our lives. We're never left to to go through life alone. We have Christ as our ever-present helper. Ever-present helper. Who wants to help? And we place our gifts, we place our talents, we place everything in His hands. Everything in His hands. Our pain, our regret, our bitterness, our anger, we place it in His hands. As smelly and insignificant as it looks, we place it in His hands. And in His hands, He took bread and smelly fish and He multiplied it. And so he wants to take those things that eat away at our souls. And he wants to replace it with his presence. With his healing presence. You all have something to put into God's hands. All all of you. It's not one person here that doesn't have anything to put into the hands of God. You need to think and reflect about it this week. What is it that you need to put into the hands of God? And then lastly, he brought his disciples to a safe place interesting how the story ends. It's really interesting. Yes. Go back and reread the story this week. It says, as soon as Jesus arrived, as soon as Jesus arrived, not a minute afterwards, but as soon as Jesus arrived, the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Took it, they took him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were, immediately where they were heading. Immediately. In Psalm 107 and verse 30 it says, Then they were glad when it grew calm. And he guided them to their desired haven. Because only Jesus can bring us to a safe place. And we only get to the safe place when we allow Jesus into the boat. When we acknowledge his presence with us. Immediately, says John, immediately they go to a safe place. A safe place. Immediately to a safe place. And so, as you go into this new week, as you allow Jesus into the boat, as you place all your concerns and joys into his hands, just remember that he is always watching over you, that he will come, that he will help you, and that he says, it is I, it is I, do not be afraid. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more, than we, all we could ever ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us. In His name. Amen. Your tithes and offerings will be received.